before people get married, there's a lot of things they need to talk about. Or maybe before you get into some kind of business partnership with somebody, or before you're making a, a large commitment. Um, but before you get married, you talk about a lot of things. You might do premarital counseling, and you might talk about like your family background. Maybe you would share um, your preferences about different things. Do you want kids or do you not want kids? You might talk through religious beliefs, sex, money, all the kind of really important things. Hopefully, you're going to be talking through those before you make this big decision and commit to somebody. But I feel like there's a gap. I feel like in premarital counseling, when we help people prepare for marriage, I feel like there's a gap. I need to talk to the counseling center about this. I need to talk to them about this thing that nobody's talking about. Nobody talked to Chris and I before we got married. It's an important topic. It's called holiday food. Now, it's a divisive topic. And you could, what if you accidentally married into like a salad on Thanksgiving family? Then what? Now you've made a lifetime commitment to a person and you're stuck with this horrible holiday food. People have really really big opinions about this. Forget white lights and colored lights. This is way more important. You can do it. That's outside your house. You don't even have to look at that. I need to know like what kind of potatoes are you serving at Christmas? This is what I need to know before I make a commitment. Now, I got lucky. Chris and I did not talk about this before we got married. I didn't know. I was young. I was uninformed. I didn't know that I should have asked this question. I got lucky. There's good food at my in-law's house. I mean, I have had to make a concession. They do whipped potatoes instead of mashed potatoes. It's, you know, not, nobody's perfect, so I understand that. But it, it worked out in my case. But I want you to be sure to think about that because, you know, when you, when you get into a family and they have their special food, your, yours might be missing, they might do things wrong. Chris got extremely lucky to marry into my family. Now, I'm a terrible cook, so I'll just put that at the outset. But thank God, my grandmother and my mom are excellent cooks. And before my grandmother passed away, hers was like the holiday house with all the special foods. And now my mom carries on that same tradition with her sisters, excellent holiday foods. So Chris knew this about us. He had been to holiday gatherings with us. He had experienced all the good food. But he had not been to Christmas morning until after we were married, right? You know, because before then, we were still going to our own houses. Well, Christmas morning is about the only time that my mom is not in charge of the food. She is in charge of the food at every other event, and rightfully so, because she's a great cook. Christmas morning goes to my dad. Some of you know him, good at many things. The kitchen is not one of them. But I have great memories of Christmas morning. And before that first Christmas morning, I told Chris, okay, he's kind of asking like, well, what do you guys do? Like, you know, what's the setup? It's not explaining, like we're gonna get up, we'll do presents and stockings. I said, and then my dad makes waffles on Christmas morning. And Chris is like, great, he loves waffles. What he did not know and what I didn't know was not normal was that when my dad makes Christmas morning waffles, that is ego waffles. <laughs> that is waffles from the freezer onto the pan. Then onto the table with butter and syrup. And I thought it was great. Chris was majorly let down. <laughs> this was a real disappointment in his life. So see, had he asked better questions in our premarital time, he would have found out about this. But potatoes, of course, are a big, a big debate, specifically sweet potatoes. People have different opinions about this. Just quick show of hands. Do we have any marshmallow sweet potato people in the house? Okay, do we have any brown sugar and pecan type of people in the house? Okay. Some of both. So in our face, see, people feel strongly about this. <laughs> this is a hot topic. We could do an Instagram poll about this later today. Ashley, we need to throw that up. Just let people um, make a decision on this. So in our family, we do a recipe. It's amazing. I can share it with you if you want. But it, it, it includes the zest of an orange and the juice from a full orange in the sweet potatoes, y'all. And then we use the large marshmallows. Not, don't come at me with the little tiny marshmallows. The large marshmallows get broiled at the very last minute. It's one of the best parts of any holiday meal for us. The last two years, I have gotten to make that dish 50-50 on success, but that's okay. One of them was excellent. But over the years, we also started trying the pecan and brown sugar ones. We're like, those are really good sweet potatoes. For years, we've just been making both because it's America. We can have two sweet potatoes. It doesn't matter. But people talk about this kind of stuff because it's important to us. Food and meals, people have strong opinions. We recently went on a trip with my whole extended family. I think half of our conversations about where we were gonna eat the next time. Like that's just part of what we were talking about. And it's because food and gathering around the table are such a special sacred thing. 
It's so important when we get a chance to gather with people over a special meal. There are beautiful and rich traditions in every single culture, in every single religion around the world that have to do with special foods, that are these moments where people are sharing food together that means something to them, that has a significance. Maybe it's a family significance, maybe it's religious significance, maybe it's their community or their culture, but it's those special foods that mark these special moments. You eat foods at certain times that make you think of memories or connect you to some kind of story that means something to you. This is not new. For as long as we have been able to record in writing about religion and culture and traditions, there are records of people having special foods and meals that mean something to them. So this goes back as far as there are written records and I'm certain beyond that. Throughout human history, this idea of gathering around a table for a special meal When you start to read the Bible, you will notice there are special meals in the Bible. Over and over, you see these special moments where food is mentioned or certain meals that are mentioned that have great significance that people repeat over and over again. One of the most significant meal traditions in the Bible comes from the Old Testament out of the story of Exodus when the Israelites are escaping from Egypt. The Israelites have been enslaved in the land of Egypt for years, and Moses was sent by God to go talk to the Pharaoh to try to negotiate this release of the people of Israel. And it was not going well, so God sends plagues to the land of Egypt to convince Pharaoh to let the people go. Now, I'm not gonna tell you that whole story. Go back into Exodus and read it. It's a fascinating story. Um, We won't have time to get into all of that today, but I want you to know the last plague was the most severe. It was the scariest. It was the plague of the firstborn, that a plague was gonna come that would strike down the firstborn son of every household. Obviously, a devastating um, event that was gonna happen, but the Israelites were given specific instructions of what to do so that their sons would be saved. They followed special directions. They smeared the blood of a certain type of lamb on their doorposts so that the plague would pass over their houses. Now that word Passover, you might recognize because it became a really special meal and a really special tradition for the Jewish people. It's the feast of the Passover. It's marking this moment when the plague passed over their houses. And they were told, even then when it was happening, that every year they were to celebrate the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread. For a week, they would eat bread that had no yeast in it. The yeast comes out of the bread like the Israelites come out of Egypt. And I'll read you a little snippet of this from Exodus 12. Obey these instructions as a lasting ordinance for you and your descendants. When you enter the land that the Lord will give you as he promised, observe this ceremony. And when your children ask you, what does this ceremony mean to you? Then tell them. It's the Passover sacrifice to the Lord who passed over the houses of the Israelites in Egypt and spared our homes when he struck down the Egyptians. Then the people bowed down and worshiped. The Israelites did just what the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron. So they're being told what to do during this Passover moment, during the plague, so that the the plague would pass over their houses, but immediately they're also given instructions for how to remember this moment. Because God knows that when incredible things happen in our life, it changes us in a really fundamental way, but we're forgetful. And it's easy as you get farther away from that event to start to forget the power of what's happened. And so right away, God says, this is going to be a special tradition, this Passover meal, the festival and leavened bread for a week before. You're going to observe that every single year. You're going to remember how I delivered you out of slavery, how I saved you. You're going to have this meal together. And the part I love about it is they're going to say, the children in your family are going to say, why are we doing this? Has anyone's children ever said that? Why are we doing this? (laughs) And then you get an opportunity to tell the story at the Passover meal. Now, as we move into the New Testament, you still see mentions of important meals. And an interesting thing to remember is that Jesus was a Jewish man. He grew up in a Jewish family. Jesus would have observed all of these festivals and feasts and fast days with his family growing up. He would have known all of these stories. This was a part of who he was. He would have celebrated the Festival of Unleavened Bread and he would have had the Passover meal with his family and his community every single year. He would have been a part of those rich traditions. And we get to hear about one Passover meal that Jesus shared because it was what we call the Last Supper. It's a story that we hear in Holy Weekend. We'll probably talk about it again later this year as we get closer to Easter. But Jesus' disciples say, 
what, what do you want us to do to prepare for the Passover? And he gives them some special instructions. And the disciples get a room above um, a house of someone they know, and that, uh, hence the name Upper Room that we talk about. So Jesus and his disciples are actually having the Passover meal when something really important happens. Jesus is having this holy moment with his disciples. They're sharing the Passover. They're retelling the story of how God saved the Israelite people and brought them out of Egypt, delivered them from slavery. And Jesus knows that the next day he's gonna be crucified. And he's having this conversation with his disciples, trying to prepare them for what's to come. And they mostly don't get it, but they're trying to understand. And there's a lot of dynamics at play there. But something special happens during the Passover meal that I wanna read to you today. We're gonna to read it in two different places. When you, the four gospels in the New Testament, there's a lot of overlapping stories. Different writers are gonna tell you about the same experience. Like if you have something cool happen in your family, if I ask all the different people that were there, they would have just a slightly different take, right? Because you're experiencing it from your own perspective. So in the gospels, we get to hear about these events from a few different people's perspectives. So I'm gonna read you two perspectives on this moment. So they're having the Passover meal all together. They're retelling this important story of their faith. And here's what happens. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body. Then he took a cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Do you recognize what got started during the Passover meal? It's something we're gonna do a little later. Jesus took bread like how we do here, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he took a cup and he said, this is my blood that's been poured out for you for your, the forgiveness of your sins. The communion meal started during a Passover meal with Jesus and his disciples. He is marking that something amazing happened in Passover. Jesus, God delivered us from slavery in Israel, but now there's a new covenant coming. And through the power of the cross and death and resurrection, Jesus is going to deliver us from slavery again, but this time slavery to sin. Now you got to remember the disciples don't know about the cross yet. They don't know about the empty tomb yet. It hasn't happened yet. It's going to be the next day and the day after and the day after that. But Jesus is instituting a new meal, a new tradition. So let's hear how Luke heard that same, that same night, Luke 22, 14 through 20. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I won't eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, <clears throat> excuse me, which is poured out for you. So here is Jesus at the Passover meal. They all know what the Passover is. They know what they're celebrating. And he says, and now there's something new happening. Now it's my body and my blood that's gonna be given for you for, for freedom and redemption, for salvation. Jesus takes the bread and compares the bread to his own body and he takes the juice and compares it to his own blood. And the disciples are experiencing this and the miracle hasn't happened yet. But after Jesus' death and resurrection, they remember his words. Did you hear he says, do this in remembrance of me? They understand that Jesus was giving them a new meal, a new tradition, a new covenant, something new to celebrate because something big is happening. And the early church started having this communion meal, this last supper, every time they got together because they knew that sharing the cup and the bread was an important part of connecting themselves to the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is not a new idea. This idea of having a meal to help us remember and celebrate, this has been going on for generations at that point, but that's why Christians are still talking about communion even now. It's because this meal connects us to the miracle of our faith, to the heart of the gospel. 
Now, Christians in different denominations celebrate communion a little differently. So if you didn't grow up coming to church, this might all be new to you. But if you grew up maybe in a different church, churches do this a little bit differently, and that's fine. It just has to do with tradition. But Cokesbury Church is a United Methodist Church. That's the denomination that we're a part of. And we in the United Methodist Church believe in two of what are called sacraments. Sacraments are outward and visible signs, things that we can see and touch and do, that are symbols of what's happening internally, spiritually with us. Now, it's kind of cool today because today we're experiencing both sacraments. The United Methodists believe that baptism and communion are the two places in life where we get to have these glimpses of these tangible reminders of God's grace and love. So we got to be a part of Owen's baptism a little while ago, and that, that cold water, the, the experience of feeling that on your skin, it's this celebration of being washed of our sins, being made new in Christ. And then we're gonna experience the other sacrament in a little bit where we taste bread and juice and it's in our hand and we can taste it and feel it. Sacraments for us are a place where we connect with God. But they're just outward signs of the stuff that's going on in here, the way that the Spirit is at work. Now, United Methodists recognize two sacraments. There's other denominations that recognize more sacraments than that. And there's nothing at all wrong with that. That's just a difference of tradition. But sometimes when we take communion, people are a little confused by it, and they're not sure exactly what it is or what to do or if they're allowed. In the United Methodist Church, we have what's called an open table, and that means that anybody who is hungry for the grace and love of Jesus Christ is welcome at this table. It's not our table, it's God's table, which means that everybody who is hungry for Jesus is welcome. So later on in the service, you're gonna be coming up um, to the front and you're gonna, get, you're gonna be given bread. And that's an important thing because you don't come up and take the bread, right? We don't take grace. We are given grace. We are given the gift of Jesus's body and blood. So someone will hand you a piece of bread and if you're at home or you're listening to this later, you can get some bread and juice and have this moment wherever you are and know that you're connected to us here and that you're connected to this experience that we're all having together. Now, in the United Methodist Church, the juice that's in our cup, the juice that's in this cup right here in front of me is grape juice. Now, the tradition for hundreds of years would have been that it was wine, that that was the way that Jesus and his disciples would have had Passover. That would have been what was in the cup that evening um, when Jesus started that. But something happened in the 1800s in the United States. There was a thing called the temperance movement. And people got really keyed in to the fact that alcoholism was running rampant in this country. And churches started to get concerned about that, started to get concerned about alcohol. So what you may not know is that the, the Welch family, Welch's grape juice, That is a Methodist family from the United States that wanted to figure out a way to pasteurize grape juice in such a way that it would not ferment so that they could have grape juice in church for communion. Now, we think of grape juice, this is the fact of life, we have this, it's no big deal, but that was not something that they'd had before. So the Welch family was a Methodist family who came up with this technology. Um, They were seeing that technology being used in other areas. I thought, I wonder if that would work with grape juice. Lo and behold, it did. And here, you know, a couple hundred years later, we are still doing that. A way that anybody could come and have communion and not have any kind of roadblocks in between them and experiencing this special meal. So when we eat the bread and we taste the juice, it is a reminder to us that Jesus Christ died on the cross for our sins. It's a reminder that Jesus died for us, but that death could not hold him in the grave, that he overcame death through resurrection, that we would get an opportunity to have freedom and salvation, that we would have an opportunity to be with God in heaven forever. So if you're here or you're listening and you've never had communion before, I want you to know you're welcome to do that today. Or if you've taken communion a million times and never really thought about kind of what it meant or why we do it, that gives you a little bit of um, the background about what it is and why it's so special to us. And at Cokesbury Church, we try to have communion about once a month um, as much as we're able. And so that's why we're gonna do that today. But the important thing for us in doing this the first time that we're gathering together in the new year is that I want us to remember that God's table is set for us. God has set a table for us by providing a way for us to have salvation, by providing us a way to be in relationship with him. God has created space for each and every one of us in the family of God. And maybe for years you've been feeling like you're sitting at the kid's table, 
Like you're just glad to be invited at all. You don't, you don't even need a place at the big table. You just wanna be nearby because you don't feel worthy to sit at God's table. But today's the day. Today's the day you hear that there's nothing you have to be worthy to, you know, nothing you have to do to be worthy of sitting at God's table and being in God's family. You, you are invited, every single one of you. When Jesus died for our sins, it was for all of us, not for just a certain kind of people who say a certain kind of thing or act a certain kind of way. God sent Jesus to die on the cross for every single one of us. There is a seat saved with your exact name on it. There's not some quota that's gonna be met and you're gonna get left out. There's a seat with your name on it. There's a place at the table with a little name card for you. You don't have to waste a single day waiting on the outside. Exactly as you are today, with exactly the past you have, with the present that you have, with the future you're going to have, you are worthy of this meal because God says you are. Because Jesus Christ died for your sins and made you worthy, redeemed you. Now God tells us we can come exactly as we are. We just come hungry to God's table and we get filled up with all the things that we need. And you're invited today, you're invited every day, regardless of anything going on in your life. But it's not just about our seat at the table because once you have sat at your seat at God's table and once you've accepted that grace and that forgiveness, you start to look around and realize there's other chairs that haven't been filled yet. The Lord's Supper, or as we've been calling it, communion, That word communion is because when we take this meal, we're communing with God and with each other. Now that word communion, it makes you think of the people that are companions in your life, the people that are in your community, and you start to think about who in my life is not sitting at God's table, who feels left out, who feels excluded, who doesn't even know that they're invited into God's love. And when you start to think of those names, you've got your list for this year. Who can you invite to God's table this year? Write that person's name down, put it in your phone, and start to pray for them. Take time to invite them to church with you. You may invite them for years before they ever say yes, but at least they know that they're included. They know that they're invited. Think of the people in life who need companions on this journey. That word companion comes from a Latin word. The calm part of it, C-O-M, means with. And then panis, the companion part, that means bread or food. So companion is somebody you share bread with. And when we look around our life and think, who are our companions? Who are the people that we're sharing bread with? Who are the people that are around us who are lonely and hurting, who don't have anyone to share this kind of meal with, who don't have anyone in their life reminding them that they are loved and that they are wanted and they are needed? That's who we need to invite back to this table. So in a minute, we're gonna celebrate this meal together, but I want us to also do it thinking of the people who aren't here yet. Think of the people that God is laying on our hearts to invite. And that might be sharing a link with them to a service before they ever decide to come on campus. That might be just having coffee or sharing time with someone to let them know that you're thinking of them. You know that sound when you go to an event or a party or a gathering and and somebody goes, oh gosh, there's not enough tables and chairs. And people start to throw out new tables, new tables, new tables. And then you know that sound of chairs like scraping across the ground as people are pushing them up to the table? That is what was happening as Jesus was hanging on the cross. Jesus was making a way for the table to get bigger and bigger and bigger so that every single one of us could dine at the feast of God's heavenly banquet an eternity that starts now and goes beyond our death to when we are in heaven with God forever. I wonder if Jesus could hear that sound. I wonder if he could hear those chairs being pulled up as he hung there for us, as the tomb became empty, as the stone was rolled away. I want you to think today about this meal, about this invitation, about how life-changing it is. And then I want you to start to pray about who's not here, who needs to know that they're invited. Let's pray. God, I pray over each and every one of us today the words of Psalm 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the one who takes refuge in him. God, we're hungry for this meal. We are hungry for your grace. Blessed are we who take refuge in the sacrifice and resurrection of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen.